Sanity is a prison that serves no purpose but to stifle the creative mind. These were the words so often spoken by the itinerant poet who occasionally visited my quiet port city. In my youth, I admired the man. His words to my eye were more profound than anything I had ever heard before. Something about the way he strolled from place to place, never following a schedule or harboring any real responsibility, held a certain allure to me. From the outside, his life was the epitome of freedom. After I had grown, it was time for me to go out on my own. I thought back to the Wanderer. His whispered philosophies, formed through self-reliance and what I perceived to be adventure, lit a fire deep within me. I decided that I would follow his example and live the life of a vagabond. My parents, being hardy, dock-working people, were pleased with that. At the very least, I would see more of the world than this foggy harbor. I did travel the country for a time, and saw all manner of beautiful sights. I've run through grassy fields whose lush colors were a painting brought to life. I've stood in awe beneath titanic trees that look as if they hold up the heavens themselves. I've watched the morning sun cresting over a field of sunflowers and filling the sky with deep, twisting hues of orange and red. A memory in particular holds a special place within my heart, especially now. Had I spent more time analyzing the poet whom I'd idolized for years, I likely would have seen that he was nothing more than a drunken vagrant. He was no grand philosopher, no genius of a bard. But I suppose if children didn't see the world through rose-colored lenses, nobody would ever aspire or dream again. A few years of traveling had left me penniless, filthy and exhausted. I found myself slipping further and further into a bottle, never knowing where one day would begin and another would end. It didn't take long for the drink to consume me and leave me a shell of my former self. No more did I wander from one town to the next. Instead, I made my way from tavern to alley and back again. The townspeople began to grow tired of me. Bartenders would rarely tolerate my presence as they knew I couldn't pay for a drink. One night, when the thirst had grown too much to bear, I tried my hand at stealing a small cask of wine. Naturally, the townspeople took notice of my disheveled, unwashed form trying to slip into the tavern storeroom. The authorities were called, and I was forced to make my escape. Hiding in the labyrinth of alleys, my began to cry out in agony. It had been far too long since I'd had a proper drink. My limbs were cold and stiff. Despite the bracing chill, I sweat profusely, soaking through my clothes and adding to my already vile stench. My head throbbed, and it felt as though it was splitting in two. I lied there in the dirt, crying, and trying desperately to sleep away the thirst. My eyes were clouded and unfocused when I finally came to. The sun had sank, and a bright crescent moon now hung in the sky. Trying to blink away the aches in my skull, I soon became aware of the fact that I was not alone. A man stood opposite of me, obscured by the shadow of a looming wall. He stepped into the light, stopping only before his face could be given definition. His clothes would appear almost regal, fine and proper. A shroud he had draped across his shoulders gleamed in the moonlight. I was immediately reminded of the fairy tales I'd heard as a boy, about an imp who threads straw into gold yarn. You look unwell, he spoke. His voice was soothing, melodic. There was a hint of something else that I couldn't place. Surely this is no place to rest. The stranger's aura was magnetic, hypnotic. I found myself kneeling before him and begging for just a few coins. Enough to buy a drink and end these horrible pains. Without realizing it, I had begun to weep before my mysterious companion. The man raised a solitary hand to quiet my pleas his cloak glinting enchantingly as he moved. He cocked his shrouded head and seemed to size me up before he spoke again. If it is what you truly desire, I could give you what you ask for and be on my way. You'll have your drink and we shall never cross paths again. He paused for a long moment, 
I could feel his shadowed face twist into a smirk. Or, I can take away your suffering. I can free you from the hold the bottle has on you and save you from a life of poverty. But be warned, no matter what you choose, your decision will be final. The stranger offered me an outstretched hand, which I instinctively took. He pulled me up to my feet and stood silently as he awaited my answer. I thought, as much as I could with my head pounding like it was. The last few years had been torturous. My family had since passed on. I had nowhere else to turn. The thought of living one more day under the thumb of this damn thirst was more than I could bear. As if he could sense my thoughts, the stranger reached beneath his gilded shroud and produced a single wooden cup and a small pouch of liquid. He poured the liquid into the cup, and I found myself confused. It smelled almost like wine. I opened my mouth to question the man, but he spoke before I could. One last drink to send your troubles on their way. One last drink before a bold new day. He handed me the cup, and I stared deeply into the still, swirling liquid. Its aroma was intoxicating like the sweetest desert flower plucked fresh after a solitary bout of rain. With a deep breath, I drank from the cup. The drink filled my mouth, and its flavor danced across my tongue in a graceful ballet. This was the drink fit for a king, liquid euphoria. As it rushed down my throat, my eyes rolled back into their sockets, and every inch of my body felt relief. Gone was the pain, the chills, Gone was the need to drink. This magnificent nectar filled my body with warmth I had never experienced before. My legs grew weak, and I eased myself onto the ground. The pure relaxation set me drifting, before I knew it, into the most blissful, beautiful sleep I had ever known. I awoke to the sound of a voice singing in the distance. The sound was discordant and haunting, reverberating and warping as it traveled into my ears. A siren song. It drew me from my slumber in an attempt to find its source. The longer the tune rang out, the more of the sense of overwhelming anxiety knotted its way into my stomach. I felt as if it was burrowing into my ears, forcefully striking every nerve on its way to my brain. I had to strain to avert my focus. I began to take stock of my surroundings, only now realizing that I was no longer in the alley. The room, or rather, cell I found myself in was built with cold, dark stone. The ceiling domed above me, peaking only inches from my head. A makeshift bed of straws and loose cloth lay on the floor. A reddish-brown stain darkened the space where my head had previously been. Instinctively, I ran my hands across my scalp and face, searching for any signs of an injury. To my dismay, Dried, crusted blood trailed along my ears, nose, and the corner of my mouth. What had the stranger's gold done to me? How long had I been unconscious, bathed in the blissful nothingness? Where was this place? My train of thought was interrupted as the warm glow of a torch mounted beyond the doorway caught my eye. I made my way across the cold floor. The sound of my bare feet connecting with the stone caught me by surprise. Looking down, I discovered that all of my clothes had been removed in my sleep. I shivered, trying not to imagine what else may have occurred while I was asleep. The doorway was fitted with a dark iron gate, though it was relieved to find it unlocked. I pressed forward, and the rusted hinges of the gate squealed in protest, its cries bouncing and echoing down the dimly lit corridor. My heart sank as the chilling, unnatural singing in the distance came suddenly to a halt. I felt my blood pressure skyrocket as the sounds of feet hurriedly slapped the ground to my left. Without much time to think, I quickly made for the opposite direction, sprinting with every ounce of energy that I had. I chanced to look over my shoulder to see if I could identify my pursuer, but to my horror, I only saw an encroaching blackness. The torches that lined the walls at irregular intervals were going out, one by one. The approaching footsteps grew difficult to distinguish from my own as I raced harder into the unknown before me. 
The corridor veered sharp to the right. Seeing the turn for a second too late, I planted my left foot hard in an attempt to stop myself. In doing so, my foot slid on the uneven, damp stone. It was caught in a crack. My momentum continued to push me forward, throwing my weight and robbing me of my balance. As my body cascaded to the floor, I felt a sharp snapping in my trapped ankle. I screamed in pain as tears began to sting my eyes. I took one look at the awful angle of which my foot had been twisted and immediately felt myself get lightheaded. Bile rose up in my throat, my vision clouded for a moment. It was when the horrible singing rang through the hall and that ever-growing shadow that I was able to regain a shred of my composure. I fought desperately with the jagged stone that gripped my foot like a vice. I was able to wrench it free, though in doing so, I vomited down my own chest and stomach. I struggled to lift myself, putting all of my weight on my right leg and leaning against the wall. My pace had slowed considerably, and at this rate, I had no chance of escaping my mysterious singing pursuer. My heart pounded in my ears as the horrible song grew louder and louder. The faster I tried to hop, the more hopeless I felt. I was about to give up when the wall opened up beside me, and I fell hard into a cell, laid out exactly like my own. I stifled my cries of pain as my ruined foot flopped helplessly. I crawled into the room and pressed myself into the corner, silently praying to whatever was chasing me wouldn't see me. I could hear the flames of the torches extinguished one by one as the footsteps and singing grew closer. When the torch opposite to the cell door went out, I had to clasp a hand over my mouth just to attempt to quiet my panicked breathing. I could hear wet feet slapping as they slowed from a sprint to a cautious walk. That damn singing had calmed as well. No longer was it loud and echoing, as if it was trying to be heard. Instead, it grew soft and deliberate. The voice was inhuman. A poor imitation. It was a sickening combination of male and female. High and low pitches. The person... No. The thing admitting that nightmarish sound was singing directly to me. I knew I was close. It knew I was listening. The footsteps in the hallway smacked back and forth outside the doorway. The thing was pacing as if it decided its next course of action. Or, more likely, stalking its prey. I scanned the near-perfect darkness, straining to make out anything I could use to defend myself. I found myself only loose pieces of stone, pebbles broken off from the old, grimy stone walls. Clutching one tightly in my hand, I waited for the thing's pace to carry it off to the left of the door. Once it did, I leaned out and threw some stones as hard as I could, trying to send it past the creature and to create an opportunity for escape. I spent many years practicing my skills as a poet. One would think that experience would come in handy when accurately trying to depict the terror I felt in those moments that followed. Sadly, words are fickle. Human language simply doesn't have the capacity to describe the level of dread one feels when they are faced with living madness, with things that are simply impossible, yet exist nonetheless. When I let the pebble fly, I began to make my way out into the hall. It was when I heard the clatter to the ground mere inches away from me that the dense pit formed in my stomach, sinking into my being, pulling all sense of hope with it. The fragment of stone had struck the creature directly, alerting it to my presence. The instant I turned to face the sound, the entire corridor filled with near-blinding orange light. Just the brief glimpse of the creature that had been chasing me shattered my reality. My whole life became an insignificant question. Every fiber of my being was reduced to nothing. This was horrid, an affront to nature, an abomination of the eyes of God. At the same time, it felt divine itself. It felt so much greater than anything I had ever encountered. With its countless, glassy eyes, it pierced every molecule of my body. It picked me apart and put me back together again. It recast me into its own image. My limbs stretched until the skin erupted, 
and I only saw raw muscles remained beneath it. My head swelled. A massive cancerous tumor formed of tiny limbs and malformed faces, all laced together with slime and viscera. My two eyes became countless, unable to see anything and everything. Time became irrelevant. Future blended with past. Reality blended with nightmare and dreamscape. Everything became one. One became everything. Sanity is a prison, to be sure. However, its purpose is so much more than one wandering minstrel could ever have imagined. Behind its bars are the secrets of the universe. The beginning. The end. Every minute of every day. Of every being that ever was. Is. Or will be.